Today I'll be talking about the Vikings in Wales, how they came to influence this country and its history and its politics and its culture. The Viking world we tend to be familiar with originates out of the Norwegian fjords and from this into the Faroe Islands and the Shetlands, the coasts of Scotland and going up to Iceland and Greenland. But actually Ireland and England were much a part of that world too. And Wales between the two was often quite a bridge between all of these. If you go down the coast of Scotland from the north, you had the Kingdom of the Isles, which became a Viking center, especially during the 10th century. And from the Irish settlements, Wales was just across the water and it was only a matter of time before it became pulled into this Viking world. It was only a matter of time before it was pulled into an island sphere culture. If you haven't subscribed yet, hey, hit that button now. Before I begin, I want to explain two place names which I'm going to say quite often. So I'm going to use the Welsh name because I think it's appropriate that we use the native names for places when we're talking about Wales. The first of these is Ynys Môn and the English name is Anglesey. This was the center of Viking activity in Wales at the time. So it's quite important. The other one is Tadewi, which was and is a religious center in the south of Wales and it became a focal point of Viking activity as well. Quite violent kind. Why did they leave the Norwegian fjords? Well, food was getting scarce. The world went through a period of colder weather. The Norwegians or the Norsemen took to the sea, like the Danes did as well, and the Swedes, and collectively they were called the Vikings. The Welsh were such a part of their world that the Welsh gave them a name. Llechlinwyr and their lands or the fjord lands specifically were called Llechlin which came to be called Norway later and then later it meant all of Scandinavia but it shows how much of Wales's world the Vikings were that they became familiar with them to the point of giving them their own name Llechlinwyr we have a rather one-sided view of history regarding the Vikings because the ones who wrote about them were usually those being attacked by them. The Vikings did have writing but it wasn't that that was noted most often. And one writing that we have earlier on is from Britus Hoesogion which was the chronicle of the Welsh princes. And they had this to say about a Viking attack on Tavoe, the religious center in the south, in the year 810. Dengmona the Guid Kant oi thoid Christ, and the other Sayad the Nadolig, a shall squid menu, a gabi vorro or life, a rescribble and hosh and a spreadine. King Roger the Great or Roger Maur who reigned for over 30 years between 844 and 878 defeated a Viking army here on Cadigno Beach near a Gogarth, this big rock behind me. As you can see, these waters would have been quite fjord-like, in some cases home-like, to the Viking who came here. And I can't show you with myself in the picture, but because the sun, but here. And for those Vikings in Viking-controlled Dublin and the Kingdom of the Isles, a simple battle and their leader being defeated wasn't going to deter them for very long. They came back. There's a lot of colors I don't know where to go 
see a lot of colors Only feeling blue There's a lot of colors Lost within a day Don't rely on others To get you through the maze The dreams are now the same for me Drowning in the sea There's too many voices Talking back at me There are a lot of choices Waiting to be made Too many choices As the times wore on into the late 9th century, the perpetrators of these raids themselves gradually changed from being Vikings from the fjordlands of Norway more to being Hiberno Vikings from Dublin and the Kingdom of the Isles in the Isle of Man. They had become part of the world they had come to attack and they themselves then began to change through it Wales by joining Wales and becoming part of it. These raids and attacks were not the only way that the Vikings changed Wales. They came to be major political players. And with Dublin being ruled by the Vikings, they came to hold sway over parts of Gwynedd at times as well. And the Irish Sea or the Celtic Sea became a fusion of Norse, Irish and Welsh political players. The king, Griffi the Pshuelen, was among these. By the 11th century, this created a situation in which the Welsh Kingdom of Gwynedd was caught between Irish and North political attempts to expand their power. Twice, you had a ruler of the Norse named Magnus trying to either rule over Ireland or invade and conquer England. And you had the Irish themselves in response to this, trying to expand and laying claim to the Kingdom of Gwynedd, at least by family line and lineage or title. The Welsh, however, had very different plans for their country themselves. And in the Kingdom of Gwynedd, a very cunning and merciless king rose, Gryffydd Llywelyn, who killed anyone in his path, essentially, be they foreign or Welsh, to secure power over Wales. And he used alliances and hostilities between Vikings, Saxons and Irish to become the King of Wales. By the reign of Gryffid ap Llywelyn, the interactions with the Welsh and the Vikings had clearly evolved into politics, building alliances or hostilities to maintain political power and kingship. He did whatever it took to secure power over Wales. He drove off Viking attacks on an mob and gained a fleet from the Irish via their alliances with the Vikings. Following Gryffydd ap Llywelyn's death in 1063, Wales splintered again into kingdoms and the Kingdom of Gwynedd in the north fell sway once again under the kings of Dublin and their Viking influences. We see how multicultural this Viking influence zone was in a 10th century Welsh poem, Armas Prydanvaur. 
A chymwyr Cymru a gwir Dylan gwyddlu wyrddon mon a phrydyn cernu a chlydwys y cynwys genyn. The men of Dublin are not included in the Irish here and Unus Mon is set apart from the rest of Wales because of its being under the influence of both the Irish and the Vikings. And in this tension between these groups we get one of Wales's greatest and perhaps its most multicultural king, Gudifidap Cunan. A biography was written about Gudifidap Cunan, and in this we get a full glimpse of the interactions of political alliances and hostilities between the Dublin Norse or Hiberno Vikings and the Welsh. For that biography, see my video on his life. But as for Griffith, his mother, Ragnach, came from Viking line and his grandfather was a Viking king in Dublin. And with him coming to Wales, he brought lots of musicians, we think, and poets. And this would have been deeply influenced by the Viking traditions, not just the Irish. His ruling Gwynedd can be seen through the eyes of being a Viking Welsh king and instituting a new cultural legacy upon the throne of Gwynedd. The conflicts between the Irish and the Norse are what enabled him to seize power in the first place more than once. Sometimes he was helped by the Irish, sometimes he was betrayed by them and he turned to the Norse, and his ability to shift between these groups made him resilient and cunning. Gudifi's life shows a constant shifting balance of power between the Welsh, the Irish and the Norse, and it shows that these were part of the same world culturally, part of the same sphere of influences and that they melted with and fused into each other and were often difficult to discern as being anything different from one another. Griffith's Viking-Welsh fusion created Gwynedd's most long-lasting and strongest dynasty, its most ambitious. This dynasty is coming into conflict with the English and how that conflict defined Wales as it was conquered, later shaped Welsh identity and came to expand into symbolism which we know today via the symbols of the Prince of Wales as Wales re-emerged as a nation out of the English Empire which had become the British Empire in the modern era and with the title of Prince of Wales coming back to Wales and used in Carnarvon. See my video on the emergence of Welsh democracy. The involvement of the Vikings in Gwynedd was so much more than just raiding and attacks. There was intermarriage, interweaving of culture. The Welsh poet tradition is ancient and in its own right stands upon its own, but the skaldic tradition of Viking poetry with its alliteration, beginning of the same syllable and many words and lines, and the use of rhetorical metaphor, this is seen in Welsh poetry as well. And it appears that these elements may have fused together at some point, probably during Gurifil ap reign. There is physical art too. We have coins, pottery and metalwork found at Llimbedr Goch and Ennismon, which was a commercial outpost of some kind planted there by the Vikings, probably at the invite of Welsh kings to increase the prosperity and commerce within their kingdom. And so we see a glimpse into trading relations between these two peoples, which gave us words we probably get the word garden from this settlement at Llenferdgoch, which is Garth in Welsh. We didn't just have these artifacts in Unas Mon, although that was the centre of it. For instance, we found this sword hilt far to the south of Pembro, where Tadoe is, and it's distinctly Viking in its origin and design. I hope you see now that Wales was part of the Viking world, especially Gwynedd, and that it came to influence its culture not just in terms of war and being raided upon, but had a deep lasting impact upon its politics via marriage, political ambitions, art, culture, and probably poetry as well. And 
This multi-dimensional multiculturalism is part of what made Wales such a fascinating and deep country culturally. Thank you for watching this and if you would like and leave a message, I'd be happy to get back to you and we will see you in the next episode. <laughs>